So, good afternoon. Um, I know you may not be able to see the color too well. Um, the shirt's a little bit hypnotic. It's a lot better up close and personal, um, mostly because of the lines on it. And I just want to do experimental reading. Uh, this book is called Bandbox. And the character is Cuddles Houlihan. Um, takes place in the 1920. It's about a hugely successful magazine. Um, I'm not going to read too much into it. I'm mostly trying to do an experimental hypnosis. Um, let's see. And basically what happens is... Um, this magazine was run by a guy named Joe Harris. His most ambitious protege has just defected to run the rival cutaway, plunging Bandbox into a newsstand death struggle. The magazine's fight for survival will soon evolve the Vice Squad, a subscriber's kidnapping, and a film actress cover subject who makes the heroines of Chicago look like the girls next door. So... Um, and then also in the beginning of this book, it mentions what an actual band box is. A neat box of pasteboard or thin wood, usually cylindrical, for holding light articles of attire. For the, like, the bands, the actual clerical colors, colors, whatever, that, um, priests wore back in the 17th century. Also attributed flimsy or so unsubstantial as a bandbox reputation from Webster's New International Dictionary 2nd edition. Um, and I like how this starts out. Um, I know the lighting's kind of bad. And maybe if somebody um, is watching this they can kind of see the mesmerizing patterns. I almost get lost in it just looking at the shirt. It's a perfect striped shirt. Be cute to have a little tank top with. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Without further ado, Cuddles Houlihan got clipped by the vodka battle as it exited the pneumatic tube. The cry of pain that filled the office came not from Cuddles, whose head still lay asleep on his desk, but from the tube. Its ultimate source was the office of Joe Harris, editor-in-chief. At this late, sozzled hour, Harrison mistakenly fed the inner office mail chute, not the translucent canister containing his angry communication to Cuddles, but the still half-full $6 quart of hooch he was regularly supplied with by the Countess in the fact-checking department. Harris glowered for several seconds at the undispatched canister before giving in to the impulse to open it up and look once more at what enraged him in the first place. A photograph of Leopold and Loeb, smiling, each with arm around each other. Perched on the edge of the upper bunk in Joliet State Prison, both of them avidly, avidly regarding the latest issue of Bandbox. The thrill killers held it open with the free hands, like a box of candy they were sharing on a back porch swing. Would make a great ad, said the ink message on the back of the photograph, whose bold penmanship Harris recognized as belonging to Jimmy Gordon. Up until eight months ago, his best senior editor here at Bandbox. I think of you as a bastard son, he once told Jimmy in a burst of bibulous sentiment. I have no idea what bibulous means. It's a very weird word. If Harris didn't think of something, the picture of the two murderous fairies reading Bandbox, the magazine that had made Jimmy Gordon and remade Jehoshaphat Harris, would be plastered to the side of every double-decker bus crawling up bus crawling up Fifth Avenue. Rummaging in the bottom drawer for another quart of vodka, Harris managed to consider, with prideful amazement, how only five years had passed since Hiram Oldcastle, the publisher, said, You want it? It's yours, giving him the bandbox job as if, as if it were the keys to a jalopy. An overpriced rag for overaged pansies. Oldcastle called the dying men's fashion book. Harris would be the magazine's last chance before Old Castle killed the slerotic 
monthly and concentrate on his more robust publications like Pinafore for the Young Mess. Edited by Harris's girlfriend, Betty Devine, and the shelter book, Mance. Give me six months. Take a year. Our old castle replied, sounding almost guilty about the eagerness with which a new editor wanted to take charge. Took Harris one business quarter to bring Ben Box to life, to hit upon a formula that lured young men and advertisers back to a magazine no one had paid attention to for years. He kept the fashion, then butched up the rest of the production, adding a slew of stylish articles about sports, politics, crime, money, and movies that went into the current age's cocktail. Newsstand buyers and subscribers were now deciding they craved the camel hair court coat on page 46 just as much as they needed to sleep with the screen siren or buy their radio stock described a few pages away. New Hope for the Shell Shock, sitting right above, looked terrific for under 200, but the magazine's turnaround had been so successful by the spring of last year, Condé Nast decided he could not leave a whole new field to this usually more down-market competitor, Old Castle. Jimmy Gordon, who had brought in most of Harris's expensive new writers, who had three bad story ideas for every good one, but with so many of each of that, which... With Harris as a filter, every issue of Bandbox still abounded for first-rate stuff. So, this gets on a little bit here. Hazel Snow buzzed Harris from the outer office. It's a bad time, he shouted. Hazel ignored him. Mr. Lord and Miss O'Grady are here to see you, she said, indifferent to anything but her desire to go home. Through the intercom, Harris could hear the squeaky sound of Hazel putting on galoshes. You picked the worst possible moment. He shouted to Richard Lord and Nan O'Grady. The English art and fashion director looked at his expensive shoes and whispered, It's about Lindstrom, I'm afraid. What about him? Waldo Lindstrom was a, the handsomest young man in New York, and Bandbox's most frequent cover model now that photographs were replacing illustrations. Harris could be more receptive to tidings of this Adonis were Lindstrom not else an omnisexual cocaine addict who had escaped from the Kansas State Penitentiary a few years ago, at the age of 20, and whose work for Old Castle Publications depended on frequent payments from Harris to the NYPD's vice squad. He never showed up, murmured Lord. Find his pusher. Call the morgue. Why are you bothering me? And why are you bothering me, he continued. He turned his eyes in anger to Nan O'Grady, the copy chief, whose lower lip had been to tumble. Tear wobbled in the lower reaches of her left eye, ready to drip down her powdered cheek. It's Mr. Stanwick's piece on Ar Arnold Rothstein. Max Stanwick, a successful writer of hard-boiled mystery novels, also wrote features for Bandbox on the nation's ever-burgeoning crime wave. Stanwick's pieces were immensely popular in the occasion for some of Harris's more memorable cover lines, Lend Me Your Ears, had announced Max's recent report on a spate of loan sharking mutilations in Detroit. And what's the problem with Stanwick, Miss O'Grady? Some people in his piece sing who instead of whom? They're gangsters, Irish. Nan, who until two years ago had edited Lady, lady Novelists at Scribner's and had taken this better paying job to help support the mother she had lived with out in Woodside, forced her lower lip to stiffen. The tear in her left eye sank backwards. It's not a question of subject versus object, Mr. Harris. It's a question of response. She pronounced it with the lilting precision of a leader singer. Who's Schwantz? Mr. Rothstein's. Well, keep it in. Nan, her lower lip now fully retracted, held her ground. I assure you, it's a no-known style book. I guarantee you that within a week of publication, half a dozen of your precious avatars will have protested its use in... More responses all around, and the balls to go with them. This is a men's magazine. Out! And close the door behind you. After Harris watched the trio, trio of departing forms through the frosted glass of his door, he allowed himself to sit back down and light a cigar. The Bowery Savings Bank loomed in the southeast, a few streets over, close to the river. He could see the absurd new towers of Tudor City, and whose tiny apartments, his aging pails, had taken to stashing chlorines and tootsies. It made Harris dizzy from his long-ago days on the Newburgh Messenger until this past fall, when Old Castle moved the company a few blocks up from its old quarters into the gleaming new gray bar. Harris, 
had always climbed a single flight of stairs to reach his job. Now every morning and evening, his stomach endured the fast jumps and drops of the gray bar's elevator. Trip made worse if he happened to be sharing a car with Jimmy Gordon. Harris took a gulp of the Countess's hooch and opened up the f evening graphic to a cartoon panel above the aviation news column. Tonight, January 13, 1928, New York's Gaslit Life featured the sketch of a buxom, stage-struck damsel, a young Lillian Russell type, auditioning for a well-fed theatrical manager. Little more than her parasol and bloomers shielded her ample virtues. Harris sighed, recalling the days of his youth, the long-ago 80s and 90s, an era before big trenchermen had ever heard of exercise, and before bosoms deflated to the pitiful boyish protuberances of modern girls like Hazel Snow. Harris was 60 years old, and in truth, much a throwback to the age of McKinley as the old bandbox had been. In order to sustain his reanimating magic, he had to keep current with all the flat chests and blue singers, tennis champions, driving this frantic new age into which he outlived himself. If only he could bring himself to leave the game. All he'd have to do for each month's cover was find a good-looking pork chop or strawberry cake, neither of which, unlike Waldo Lindstrom, would have a cocaine habit. The setting sun chose his moment to catch a silver cigarette case near the edge of Harris's desk. The case's inscription, Jehoshaphat Harris, Editor of the Year, 1927. It had only come last year when the Gotham Magazine Editors Association, whose GME awards, the Gimmies, to those in the trade, still stirred Harris's competitive juices to an almost indecent degree for a man of his age and at last recognized achievements. No, this was not going to be Jimmy Gordon's year. In fact, so long as there was anything he could do about it, Jimmy Gordon's year would forever fall on the calendar between yesterday and never. Harris threw the graphic into the leather wastebasket and grabbed the photograph of Leopoldo Mill. Beneath Jimmy's taunt, he underlined his own description. The brief directive he scrawled before dispatching the wrong cylinder through the pneumatic tube. Take care of this. He at last succeeded in sending the picture on his way. Once he heard the cylinder's distant thunk, he rose from the chair and put on his hat. So, anyway, I don't know what you might be focusing on. Um, I saw some really cool stuff at my store that had hypnotic patterns, and that'd be fun to have something really... Something that could relax somebody and make them, I don't know, maybe slow down, get their focus back for whatever they're trying to do in their life. Um, yeah, I don't know. I got this book for free. Anyway, um, that's where I'm going to leave off for that. And... I gotta take care of a few other things today. Um, I also picked up this at a book sale. It's called Bailey Kiss Angel. Can't really see the title too well. Got a lot of really good books. So, if anybody likes books, um, those are definitely good things to do and see. And I will show off this lovely kitty. That's my latest. And thank you for tuning in. Um, try to, I t do try to keep these to 15 minutes or less. And hopefully I will have a video out Sunday if I get a chance. Um, I've been trying to do those every other week and it's been really difficult. And yeah. So have a good day. Sorry about the lighting.